So um, I, I, we have a great uh, panel of, of uh, local zoning experts. And I would like to be able to ask if I could just mention their names in the order that I have them right here. Uh, if I could ask uh, uh, Mr. Um, First Selectman Moynihan to introduce himself um, and we'll go down the line uh, with the other members of this panel, this illustrious panel, so that uh, we can have some insight and, and feedback moving forward. Thank you, Tony. Uh, the last thing I am is a zoning expert. So I am the first electorate of New Canaan. Um, but we have with us um, John Goodwin, uh, who's chairman of our planning and zoning commission. Uh, Scott Hobbs, who's chairman of our housing authority, New Canaan Housing Authority. Our town planner, Lynn Avni Brooks, where I've seen the lost her on my screen, but she's, uh, she's, she's there, Kevin. Um, and then uh, we have uh, Francis Pickering, who's the uh, executive director of WestCog. And who, and uh, Representative Tom O'Day, representing most of uh, New Canaan. Our former chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission, Liza Lapap, is, is, is with us. But uh, did I cover everybody who's supposed to be? On the panel, John Angles is is, is uh, our host and our uh, as as much as an expert, more of an expert in zoning than I am. But uh, John is chairman of our town council. Great, and and uh, uh, first, let me point a hand. As as much as you might say that uh, you don't know a lot about zoning, but you're surrounded by very talented people on a local level, but also on a um, a, a state level with Representative O'Day. And as well, I want to acknowledge uh, Representative Pat Callahan, who represents um, uh, north of um, down by up by Brookfield, who has joined us as well. Um, but you, as the first selectman, share a vision, a vision of a priority and a focus for housing opportunities, diversity, accessibility. Um, please share through you as the first selectman, and then I'll go to uh, Mr. Papp and, and the current uh, uh, planning and zoning chair, your philosophy and approach to addressing um, Section 830G of the Affordable Housing State Statute and what that means and, and the impact it has on your community. Uh, if you can br bring a brief intro and we'll go to Mr. Papp and, uh, and, the, former, and the current chair of planning okay. and zoning related to Section 830G, what that means in English, the rest of the audience. Thank you, Tony. So um, thanks to the Laszlo Plap, uh, who, who was chairman at the time, after your, your idea led up a uh, affordable housing fund uh, paid for with fees uh, charged to developers on new development in town. Um, and that fund has been very instrumental in allowing us to do four redevelopment projects of affordable housing in the last 12 years or so. Um, and we've earned two moratoriums from 830G as a result of that. And I think we're probably the, one of the only towns or cities in Connecticut that actually took that approach. I, I think perhaps the state statute recommended it or allowed it, and we, we, we were one of the few to adopt it. So I asked a little, Lazo, why don't you, you know, since you were the, since you started it, why don't you just say a few comments about what you were intending to do? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, my, the, the focus here is, uh, to achieve a goal entirely with the uh, with the uh, help and uh, and uh, uh, available resources of a town, uh, not uh, not uh, not uh, allowing uh, developers to uh, have a half-ass uh, solution. Uh, 830G would allow a, a developer, and we had uh, at least three instances during my chairmanship of uh, the, in the zoning, uh, planning and zoning commission, to uh, attempt to uh, obtain a parcel, and with the 830G loaded up a, 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 a number of units. Uh, of, of uh, multiple housing, multifamily housing, and uh, uh, which would not be uh, supported by the uh, the the uh, terrain, the uh, infrastructure, 
the environment, and uh, and therefore it would not be beneficial to the to the town. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's why we uh, adopted the uh, affordable housing fund, which uh, enables the housing authority to build with a uh, down payment, obtain then uh, uh, bank assistance to build and build as much as it's, uh, it's useful for the town and uh, it is uh, uh, affordable for the for the, 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 the property. Not Thank only you. affordable for the, 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 those who want to use it, but affordable for the, for, the, for the community and for the property. Thank you, Mr. Papp, and thank you for your uh, length of service to the community and, uh, and the vision to start up this fund. And uh, if, if uh, Mr. Goodwin, as the current planning and zoning chair, how has that fund been utilized and what is the, the going forward uh, interaction and experience and the challenge that you may have in, in meeting the affordable housing moratorium numbers and the challenge of land price and the economics of, of uh, uh, building and, and property ownership in, in Lower Fairfield County, in this case, New Canaan? Yeah, thank you, Tony. And, and I think... Um... And after myself, Scott Hobbs should also talk because um, the New Canaan Housing Authority, I mean, we've had a phenomenal partnership, the Planning and Zoning Commission with the Housing Authority. And, and I, you know, I've heard in other towns it has not worked quite as well. Um, but the, basically, we're, we're and as you know, it, it, the, way the, the way it works is you need to have 10% affordable housing within your town. And if you're not there, then you have to do projects. And it's a very complicated point system. But as Kevin said, it allows, enables you to then achieve moratoriums. And the affordable housing fund has been critical in terms of giving funds to Scott. And, and the affordable housing fund is not large enough to fund the entire projects but what's critical about it is it's a Kickstarter. And then it enables Scott to then raise funding, whether it's you know, mainly debt financing to go ahead and then continue to do additional projects. And the way I think about this and the way the commission is thinking about this right now is meeting the 830G goals and continuing to get the moratoriums. And chances are we probably never get to 10% because you just hit a critical point which is the cost of land, the cost of building within New Canaan. And, and that has nothing to do with any rules that we have ever put down. It's just the nature of the beast. But the other thing the commission is now doing is we're going beyond just using the affordable housing fund, just trying to meet 830G. We are now working on additional regulations to promote additional inclusionary housing. And, and I'm happy to talk about this later, but I'm part of a group of PNC chairs within Fairfield County. And one of the things when you do, when you talk to the different chairs is we're sharing levels of experience to get additional things done. And so one of the things that we're finding is, so we, we've set a great precedent with the affordable housing fund. Other towns are now looking at that we're also now looking, though, and enhancing our regulations to promote additional inclusionary housing. And, and going back to your point about cost, Tony, is we, we do expect to see significantly more development in New Canaan. And we need to control that, but we can also control it, but we can also provide additional affordable housing above and beyond using the fund, but with additional regulations. And, and John, would it be fair to say that the town and its leadership and, and the various other entities feel a tremendous sense of urgency in meeting these goals? It's huge. It's, uh, and, and Tony, the one thing I will say is, is one of the challenges of 830G is we as a town became so focused on 830G, we, 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 we did not look at other things. And that's part of the problem. In my personal view, when you get mandates handed down from Hartford, is you, you have to achieve a specific thing. And one of the things that we've realized and we've talked about as a commission is there are lots of other tools that we can be using to promote additional affordable housing. And so we're all over this. And, and it is 
right now in turn, we have a subcommittee and our subcommittee is chaired by a commissioner who actually was a planner in New Orleans, Louisiana and in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now you talk about experience, think about the experience you get as a planner in those two cities. She's driving that effort. We're rolling out additional regulations and yeah, it's our top priority, Tony. I, I, I absolutely appreciate that. And, and you're lucky to have Mr. Hobbs who is a member of the housing authority, but also I, I know some of these conversations that we have, we, we, we sometimes uh, point out the villain and sometimes the home builders and, and developers. But Scott, I gotta tell you, every time I've heard your name, you have been a model of collaboration and, and as a builder, as a community advocate and understanding that there can be a balance and a collaborative effort to meet the developer's uh, financial model, but still be an integral part consistent with the community. So thank you very much for your vision and your willingness to, to be a part of the community, but at the same time, facilitate a business model that, that is a win-win. So Scott, can you talk about the challenges you have in being able to, to build out housing and, and, and be able to accommodate the, 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 the difficult challenges we have throughout the whole state of building affordable, accessible, and diverse housing in, in Southwestern Connecticut? For Senator, and thank you. And thank you again for all of your service. Um, I was lucky enough to learn at the knee of uh, Chuck Berman, who was the housing authority chairman who preceded me. And Chuck had, had a developer background. And he was able to go ahead and figure out how to take the funds that Laszlo had wisely been able to start and use those funds as seed money to actually do something. And without seed money, nothing can happen. Unfortunately, when you get toward affordable housing, because the rent rolls are so low, even with future help and actually doing the financing, a town has to show up and basically in a place like New Canaan has to basically show up with the land for free and with several million dollars in order to plan a project. Once a project's planned, then you can actually find a way to finance it, get it built, make it happen. <clears throat> Although again, it's, got, it's done very, very, very tight budgets. Everything's tight. And when you get toward 830G, I think a, a big failing of 830G is that it is focused upon the official definition of affordable housing versus housing that's affordable. And that's been, a, and, and it has to be a focus because 830G is solving a, a problem with a bazooka. And if a town doesn't meet the 830G requirements and get moratoriums, we can get torn apart with developments that have no business being in a place like New Canaan. As such, we have to put a priority on actually getting moratoriums, meaning that we have to go ahead and go for 60% of median area affordable housing deeded in to get to our 830G point goals. And it means that we can't really dedicate resources to doing a you know, housing that might be affordable to uh, police depart uh, to police workers or teachers who are not just beyond the beginning salary, because affordability, by definition, inside of the state right now for a one bedroom apartment, if you make fifty six thousand seven hundred and one dollars, you do not qualify for affordable housing. If you make fifty six thousand six hundred or uh, six hundred and ninety nine dollars, you do qualify, and that's a sharp level right there, which there is no meeting. You know, moving around. So we're unfortunately really dedicated to helping solve needs for people at a very specific income level and below, but if they go too far below, then they can't afford to be in the affordable housing. They need other assistance. And that's been directed really by the 830G and the threat that it poses to communities like New Canaan. Absolutely, and in addition to that, you have the deed restriction requirement that uh, holds for 40 years uh, that creates such a challenge on on a resale market and, and really caps what we do in Southwestern Connecticut. And I, I wanna go to, um, you know, Representative Thomas O'Day, uh, who has been a absolute champion in articulating fighting the A30G. And for those that are listening, uh, we started with A30G because it is a premise of the impact of affordable housing in our communities. We will delve into a little bit more of the proposals afoot right now in uh, the planning and zoning development affecting dash 8.2, which affects state enabling powers over local zoning and planning authorities as it relates to affordable housing, A30G, but also developmental plans. But it's important that the pressure of A30G 
has been one that everybody's familiar with, but I wanted to kind of elaborate. And and Tom, could you share your experience with A30G and 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 the long-standing uh, tug of war between understanding the economic realities and the land cost and development cost of Lower Fairfield County versus the desire and the mandate of the state for housing uh, uh, access and affordability. Thank you very much, Tony. And I, I should just let everybody know, Tony Tony is ranking member of P&D, Plan Development, has been uh, all over this and, and, a, and a mentor of mine for many years. So I thank you, Tony, for, for hosting this. Uh, and I just, just, I would be remiss if I didn't say something, Laszlo Papp, is the reason why, a big reason why our town looks the way it does and is the way it is. There's not, I don't think there's a person in New Canaan who's had more of a positive impact uh, on the way New Canaan is than Laszlo. And, and, and John, you've been working hard. Scott Hobbs, I mean, obviously I've said this before, our housing authority has done such a great job. And Bernard Simkin, I know is here. Yes, uh, working on our housing authority. And by the way, this is not a Republican, Democrat, or an affiliated issue. This is an issue for all of New Canaan. And we've got uh, Democrats, John Goodwin, we've got Bernard Simpkin, you know, Stephanie Thomas, who's a new state rep from Norwalk and representing part of Wilton. She spoke eloquently against uh, many of these proposals and is opposed. So uh, I, I would simply say, uh, Tony, in reaching across the aisle, we've uh, created a, a, a groundswell of saying, look, we can do better, but we're doing a pretty good job, especially in New Canaan, with, uh, with collaborative process. For example, and you were talking about how we kind of handle things in transportation. There was the bill uh, 6570, and in working with some of my friends on the other side of the aisle, uh, Jonathan Steinberg, who's opposed, um, and, and even um, even the one of the proponents, uh, uh, Roland Lamar, I, I think conceded that 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 transportation bill is going to have a hard time because of the mandates, and so. Uh, I want to hear from uh, the, uh, the experts. I want to hear from uh, you know Scott, John, uh, and and how they're in Laszlo and how they're uh, planning on going forward. But I appreciate Tony so much you hosting this and uh, and 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 New Canaan is a special place, uh, and I'm honored to represent it. And uh, and it's because we act collaboratively. And uh, so I just want to thank everybody for being here. Thank you, Tom. But could you elaborate in your experience in Hartford the perception? Of, of the reluctance and, and the idea that um, uh, of exclusivity, how far it is from the real application from Mr. Papp and, and the, the leadership of Mr. Moynihan and, and John and, and Scott. Can you articulate the disconnect from Hartford's perception versus what the mm -hmm. urgency that John has said and many of the leaders have said that they understand the need to do that? Can you can you can you share that because it's important for people to understand this is very real and could very well happen the next day because of the disconnect and not understanding how hard uh, the communities are working to meet the goals of of, of access and affordability. I can and and I'll use the the the, the kind of the, the phrase that Scott had used about using a bazooka to to do some uh, open heart surgery. They few people actually came in when I and when I was questioning people uh, that were proponents of the, the essentially the transit oriented development within a half mile of town I would ask them where are you from have you ever been to New Canaan and, and uh, virtually none of the people speaking in favor were ever from New Canaan and so when I asked them you know well, well you know do you think I being from New Canaan can tell you from North Hartford how to best develop and improve affordable housing. And, and the, the person who was testifying said, well, no. I said, so you believe in local control? And, and she said, yes. I said, well, what, what, why do you want this bill? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the Sierra Club, not on behalf of myself. So the, the disconnect is what people think is good for their community or their constituency would be good for everybody. And that's just not the way it is. And, and it sounds like common sense, but you know, uh, some people in Hartford believe legislating from Hartford is good for everybody at times. And, and that's just not the case as, as many of the people here know and, and like to hear from them. Thank you very much, Tony, very much. Thank you, Tom. And, and I want to go from a broader basis because what New Canaan is doing is to be tremendously uh, uh, commended and acknowledged, but also so many of the other towns within the Western Connecticut Council of Government, the 18 towns that are represented uh, by the executive director of West Cog, Mr. Francis Pickering, 
Uh, uh, Mr. Pickering, can, can you share in regards to the incredible pressure that A30G has imposed in, in lower Fairfield County within Westcock and what all of those communities with that sense of urgency are looking to address? Absolutely, and thank you, Tony. Um, A30G really has uh, driven the communities to develop ways to build affordable housing. And if you look over the last 20 years, from 2002 to 2019, uh, our region, the Western Connecticut Council of Governments, comprising 18 municipalities from Stanford to Westport and up to New Mil Milford and Sherman, um, accounts for 16% of the state's population. And we have built 39% uh, of multifamily housing built in the state in the last 10 years. And in the last 20 years, 48% of affordable housing, according to Connecticut General Statutes 8-30G. So one of the challenges you alluded to is a disconnect between Hartford and the region. Um, really, we are in two entirely different universes here. There's the New York City metro real estate market, where there are a lot of jobs, and hence a lot of pressure for housing. And there's the Hartford and rest of Connecticut real estate market, where there aren't many jobs, and there isn't much pressure for housing. And so we have communities uh, where there is development pressure, and we are responding. Uh, in, New Canaan has successfully used an affordable housing trust fund. Other communities, uh, Greenwich, Darien, and Westport have used a different method called inclusionary zoning, where uh, developers are compelled as part of any multifamily uh, market rate development to include affordable units. They have used this very effectively to uh, diversify their communities and provide a lot more affordable housing. Uh, if you look at the rest of the state, uh, there really has not been that much construction of 830G housing. And a large part of it is, there are two reasons. One is, and they're related, one is the rest of the state is not that unaffordable. And the reason it's not that unaffordable, so there's no reason to use 830G. The reason it's not that unaffordable is because there's not development pressure, there aren't jobs. And what's driving a lot of this discussion here is uh, a confusion between uh, what actually is opportunity and why we see differences in housing prices. The primary reason we see these differences is because part of the state has been succeeding for the last 20 years economically and part of the state has not. And we've essentially put all of our eggs into one basket where uh, if people in the rest of the state uh, are looking for work, they end up often working in lower Fairfield County because there are no jobs close to them. They can't work in their towns anymore. Uh, the bills we see before the General Assembly only look at the housing side of the equation. They don't look at everything else. They don't look at jobs. They don't look at transportation. They don't look at reinvesting in deprived communities and bringing opportunity to people. They're solely focused on putting housing in other locations and expecting people to move there. Now, of course, we don't want to impede free movement. If people want to move to New Canaan, that's wonderful. And we'll welcome them with open arms. I imagine you would at least. We welcome in West Cog, um, but we need to also provide opportunities in other parts of the state and start a real conversation about good, solid jobs and economic mobility and allowing people to stay in the communities that they're currently in with their friends and their families. Did that answer thank your you. question, Tony? Oh, thank you, Francis. And, and I so appreciate the context you bring, uh, not only for New Canaan, but also for West Cog. And, and I, I can offer and, and reiterate and, and ask for your reiteration that all 18 municipal leaders of West Cog uh, are united in addressing and, and supporting affordable and diverse housing, but recognizing that local control and their municipal uh, bodies of government is the best way to go about that. Absolutely, Tony. And I don't personally like the term local control. I really prefer to talk about participatory decision making and grassroots democracy, because that's really what it is. It's engaging the community and hearing from the community. And that's really important. That's what makes our state strong and it makes our community so special and so desirable to live in. Thank you, Mr. Pickering. I'm going to pivot and, and follow up with you with current bills that are being proposed right now in planning and development committee. And, and because I know it way too well, I, I, I dream it in my sleep. But talk to me about uh, the bill proposed, Senate Bill 1024, and some of the major components of that bill that raises a point of concern. And when you set the table of that bill's point of concern, I like to go back to the people that we talked to earlier, get their experience and their reaction to it. But what, what's very interesting and 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 frightening about this is 
the, the, the bill that was proposed in transportation that was cited by Representative O'Day mm -hmm. on transit-oriented developments, that bill supposedly was not going to move forward. And that was due to the great efforts of Tom and many of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle. But unfortunately, that concept has reared its head in another bill that is composite within 1024. So can you talk about some of the components? One being the transit oriented mm -hmm. development, but I think the other powerful statement on that that I want our local municipal leaders to cite is the, 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 re, the, the removal of has of right and local planning and zoning board on, dis, on some policy decision making on, on zoning and land use on section mm -hmm. 8 2, if you could. Set the Absolutely. table for the rest of the college. Thank you, Tony. So Senate Bill 1024 has grown out of a, a campaign called Desegregate CT. You may have heard of it. And the bill essentially um, seems to believe there's a dichotomy between uh, grassroots democracy and affordable housing. And we don't believe that's the case because as I mentioned before, the region has built 48% of the affordable housing in the state in the last 20 years of its own accord. Um, Policymakers, at least those proposing this bill, believe that the municipalities in this region are not doing it correctly and that essentially they need to pull back on zoning authority from the towns and regulate it from Hartford with a one size fits all approach. They know better than we do. And what the bill essentially would do, it would do many things. Um, the most concerning or the largest component of the bill essentially is, is, is to say, in a one half mile area around your principal transit station, so the main New, uh, New Canaan train station in New Canaan, and also a one quarter mile area around your commercial core, you must uh, allow uh, multifamily housing by right in 50% of the area. They define multifamily housing as at least 15 units per acre uh, around the train station. So if you do the math, that works out to 9,000 new housing units around the new Canaan train station. Uh, at average household sizes, that would add over 20,000 people to your towns if fully built, your town fully built out. It would uh, bring in, uh, if households only had one car, 9,000 new cars. Um, it would remove a lot of local control, a lot of zoning authority over how the development is structured. So for instance, it would prohibit uh, the new Canaan zoning regulations from requiring these housing units to have parking spaces. So hypothetically, if it were built out fully, you would have to find place to house 9,000 cars and you could not require that of the developer. Uh, the bill has many other components that are very troubling to us aside from this. Uh, and mm -hmm. legislative parlance, sometimes they're called rats. I'd be happy to speak to those as well if you're interested, Tony. Uh, and before we move on to the local experts, um, what is the as of right language? That mm -hmm. seems to be the very powerful language that's that's been inserted many times in that language. Mm -hmm. I know it as a, a, a removal of local planning and zoning and, and, and uh, conservation and governing bodies from these decisions. What does as of right mean? So uh, in zoning, you have an option of a special permit or as of right. And as of right essentially means that the development proposal, the application must go to a public hearing. Now, uh, planning and zoning commissions are extremely limited in the reasons they can use to reject an application. Uh, and the public hearing is not a reason to reject the application. They have to follow state law and they have to follow the zoning regulations that are in place at the time. Um, but there is a sentiment on behalf of the proponents of 1024 that public hearings are being used um, as a way to reject applications, uh, not in my backyard uh, philosophy. The reality is that uh, most development proposals do go through, public hearings do not stop them. Many of the communities we've talked to in Westcog say, 90, 95% of proposals that have a public hearing still go through. The purpose of the public hearing is to allow um, people who have the most information, people who live next to a property, they know where it floods, they know what the problems are. People in Hartford don't necessarily know that, people in the zoning board may not necessarily know that, but for the neighbors to come forward and say, hey, have you considered this? We have these concerns. Um, and the way I look at it is, public hearings are really an information gathering exercise to, to hear from the people 
who know the area best. Uh, I live in an area which has two acre zoning. Uh, somebody in Harvard might say, there's plenty of space to put another house. Why do you have two acre zoning? I know that if my sink runs overnight, even a drip, I have no water the next day. There's not enough water in my property to subdivide it, but that's something only I know and only my neighbors know. The purpose of a public hearing is to collect all that information, to provide additional context and information for the Planning and Zoning Commission to consider, but not to supersede state law or the zoning regulations. Thank you, Mr. Pickering. And I, 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 it was important for me to ask your expertise in setting the table. And, and the third area that I wanna inquire is, in that bill in regards to a, an expansion of, of septic and sewer capacity, which may have profound mm -hmm. waterway and environmental impact in those communities. Those are the three things that I wanna be able to share with my local officials and their input. What about the environmental impact and, and waterway and, and, and uh, sewer and septic capacity mm -hmm. increases? So th there are two issues at play here. One is the bill would require on uh, water pollution control authorities uh, to reserve capacity for hypothetical future development, which may never happen, which could prevent, say Municipality Valley wants an industrial park, they might say, we can't accommodate that, that capacity is reserved for hypothetical future housing. Um, you're probably not speaking to that, but that could impact ratepayers and economic development. The other issue is of um, septic systems. So most of the state by area is not on public sewer, it's on septic systems. Public sewers are very expensive, and the state for a long time has had a sewer avoidance policy because um, we do not want to spread development willy-nilly all over the landscape. It has adverse environmental impacts and sewers are incredibly expensive to build and maintain. Uh, we already have so much infrastructure we can barely afford to maintain that we do not want to increase the infrastructure burden per capita. Um, with regards to the specific issue here, um, 1024 would require the Department of Public Health to uh, provide, create, a, create a, a process for what are called alternative treatment systems. And so these are essentially mini packaged uh, water pollution control authority plants. They're sewage plants that are not publicly owned. They're privately owned. They're um, cut down in size. They're smaller. Um, in concept, it, you could allow a higher level of development with these the devil here is in the details. These plants, while they're smaller than a publicly owned sewage treatment facility, they are just as complicated and require the same level of expertise and uh, oversight and maintenance. They require maintenance several times a year. Connecticut has been very judicious in how it's approached this. Um, and these facilities have really only been lar used for large single tenant operations, such as a factory. They've not been used for a homeowners association. That's an important distinction. If you uh, have familiarity with HOAs, they often defer maintenance and they have non-professionals running. What happens? The roof fails and everybody has a special assessment. The difference is when a community uh, sewage system fails, it's not just an inconvenience to the owners. It's a public health and environmental crisis and it likely will have to be bailed out at public expense. Uh, a neighboring state went um, heavily in on these several years ago and then five years approximately 50% of the systems were malfunctioning. So what this really does, 1024, is it does an end run around the regulations we have in place for septic systems um, in favor of something that hasn't proven itself in the marketplace and is incredibly complex and very hard for homeowners to maintain. Thank you, Mr. Pickering. And, and as I'm watching you speak, and because of Zoom, I get to see the panel in the gallery, I'm watching Mr. Goodwin and Mr. Hobbs and, and, and Mr. Papp's facial reaction as we're talking about those things. So I'm gonna go right to you, uh, Mr. Goodwin. As the current planning and zoning chair, the issue of transit-oriented design uh, has of right re, uh, 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 removal of local zoning and planning uh, hearings and the, the sewer and septic capacity increases. What do you say to those three things as the chair uh, in addressing those concerns, which is at the forefront of what you all do on a local level and understanding the long-term environmental as well as economic interests of the town. And, <clears throat> Tony, a couple of things. I mean, one is, I mean, one, one thing I'll say a little bit away from your question, but I'll get right, right back. I'll get right back to it real fast. One of the things I've been doing for the past nine months is listening to 
um, a lot of, you know, the desegregate commit Connecticut, a lot of these groups. And, and I've, I've taken the time to think about it. Um, I've engaged in some Zoom calls with some of those organizations. And, and I think we've already referred to this, but one of the challenges is one is they don't really understand what the Fairfield County towns have been doing. Um, they tend to be very Hartford oriented, even when they come up with their arguments as to you know, why we're bad people down here in New Canaan. Um, and, and even when we've brought up what we've been doing, I, I'm just concerned that they've decided what their goals are and they're really not thinking about whether those are the right goals or not. Um, so that's concerned me, but, but to answer your question, one is New Canaan, as you know, is on a spur line, okay? So we, you know, we, the, 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 the spur whole, off the train line, that, that the spur, the, the yeah, the, the spur, yeah, the spur off the train line. And, and, you know, all my New Canaan friends will say to me, I'm a part-time commuter myself. And, and even, you know, before COVID, you know, one of our challenges is service. So this idea that a train line is going to replace cars is it's silly. Um, so that's challenge number one. And, and Francis did a wonderful job of talking about, you know, the numbers of what that would do from an overwhelming perspective. Um, the next point is, and Francis touched upon this as well, but is the usage of special permits. And, and I had a Zoom call and I won't name the representative, but she was known, she asked a really good question. And she said, well, you, you people just use these special permits to keep out development. And, and, I, and, and I was on with some other Fairfield County chairs. And we're all like, what are you talking about? We approve, in New Canaan, we approve over 95% of the permits. The objective of the permit, and for example, we have village design criteria. You know, we, we, the, the people of New Canaan are not against development, but let's keep the look of New Canaan. And that's what we're trying to do. And so the special permit is a tool to, to, to not, keep away development, not keep away certain types of development, but just to manage the development process. Um, so, so that's what we're trying to do with the special permits. Um, you know, in, in, in terms of, and, and as I said earlier, we, we know for a fact that there is a lot of development interest in New Canaan, and that's good and bad. If this bill passes, then we're going to have design that will be overwhelming to the town and will not be appropriate to the town. And we have the ability to still accommodate a lot of this development, but make it much more appropriate to the town. So, you know, and, and, quite, and the point about, you know, the sewers and everything, I, I just find that overwhelming. It's a scary prospect. And, and thank you, Mr. Goodwin. And, and, and this is not a partisan issue. This is really about uh, a, a, a proper planning and and uh, to, to manage the process so that the goal can be reached, but not with a bazooka. And I, I think, Scott, you said it best a, as a builder and also as a person that understand the business model, that being able to build at a higher capacity gives you economy of scale. It, 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 it is a, a very lucrative methodology. But that being said, it comes at a cost and, and you wear a unique hat. And, and this was not a hollow compliment I gave you earlier is the fact that you wear a hat that's unique in a sense as a leader of, of the housing authority and the, and, the, and the community responsibility, you also understand the business of building and developing. Um, these kind of rules that they go through, it's, it's kind of like, this is like a, 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 a happy day, but does it in the long term help the community and the sustainability and the viability and ultimately the, the managed growth and affordability because regardless how much you want to build there this community some of the communities down lower fairfield county are still going to be very valued and very expensive well and i think that that gets back to that issue again is to, so get back are to we are, are we building um housing that's affordable for people or are we boarding building affordable housing and the affordable housing is it's just such a technical definition that prevents us from actually addressing the needs of creating, you know, multi-tiered, very, uh, a very uh, diverse, sorry, diversity of housing options 
for people with very different incomes to come in and, and, and live here. I think one of the problems with the desegregate Connecticut people is that they're confusing a, a, um, a surplus of demand with a lack of supply. In New Canaan, there is a ton of people who want to live in New Canaan for a variety of reasons. It's picturesque, it has great schools, it's a safe place to be, you're near New Canaan. There's a whole lot of reasons people want to be here. And if you talk to the realtors, they'll tell you that there's just, it, it, again, it's a huge boom in people wanting to come in. If you were to go ahead and increase the 75, roughly 7,500 units of housing in New Canaan by 1,000 units, the price would not drop that much. It certainly would not drop to the point where it was, it was affordable by standards of people in Hartford who want to write these rules. In the meantime, we couldn't operate our schools. The buses could not actually get kids to school in time and get them home in time. Just it, physically, you literally could not do it. Um, kids would be eating lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We wouldn't have enough police. We wouldn't have enough parking. You couldn't actually make it downtown. Um, just all of the services would be terrible. So you'd greatly decrease the... Um, the livability of New Canaan, and yet really the price still wouldn't drop that much, and certainly not enough in order to affect the uh, to, to be satisfactory to those who are pushing for the official affordable housing. So it would be much nicer if being able to work as a community to consider, you know, using like a, a good idea from the desegregated Connecticut people is to allow for accessory, uh, more accessory dwellings, and it's something that New Canaan's been looking at. However, a bad idea is to make them as of right with no rules and restrictions. I mean, you get rid of the side yards, get rid of parking requirements, just make it so anyone can do it. It's much more likely that our community is able to figure out, um, uh, I forget, I'm sorry, I think I was Francis who was saying about, you know, neighbors know what's right in their community. And sometimes the neighbors will come out and they'll fight passionately for, for something that is really in their own self-interest versus the community interest. But that is kind of their right. I mean, it's their property that will be affected by this. Let them fight and let the community say, no, you're being, you're asking for too much, or no, you're making a great point, and this will actually destroy the other people. I mean, as a builder, I mean, we own some commercial property. And if all these rules went through, that commercial property is probably worth more because we could end up doing instead of you know, like some sort of commercial operation or you know, getting four or five units, you know, we could probably do 45 or 50 units. Would that be good for the town? Absolutely not. Would it be good for us? Uh, probably would be. And, and I'm still out here fighting against it because I love our town and I, I like the people in it and I like the atmosphere and the character and everything else. And, and by the way, those apartments would probably not be affordable apartments. If and we were to and do I it. appreciate that. And that's why uh, your reputation precedes you. And, and you have my greatest compliment and appreciation that it isn't always about the money. Uh, uh, Mr. Pickering, you, you had, you were going to make a comment. Yeah, I was just going to add on to that and say, if you look at 1024, there's the presumption that, uh, so 1024 would allow market rate housing by right. And there's a presumption, uh, as Scott pointed out, that providing more housing will reduce the price enough to be affordable. But that's really a perspective that only works in a very few towns. It doesn't work in uh, Southwestern Connecticut because uh, the, the, the price will not fall enough to be affordable. And it also doesn't work in the towns uh, such as, for instance, Scotland, Connecticut. For six to seven recent years recently, Scotland did not have a single building permit. The reason why Scotland did not have a single permit come forward is because it's not because the zoning prohibited all development. It's because there was no development pressure. And because there's no pressure, uh, they can't build affordable housing and changing their zoning actually isn't going to change the dynamics of the market. So there's a disconnect there. What's really troubling about 1024 is its um, ignorance about what's currently being done in Southwestern Connecticut. Uh, the, it would essentially, right now in say uh, Greenwich, Westport and Darien, a developer has to do uh, provide affordable units as a component of multifamily housing. Uh, in New Canaan, they have to pay into an affordable housing trust fund. 1024 essentially would say, you don't have to do that anymore. You can go build market rate housing without paying for affordable housing and without building affordable housing. And in our view, from the COGS perspective, what this will actually do is reduce the rate of creation of new affordable housing in the region. So it's a bit ironic, a bill intended to increase affordable housing would probably do the exact opposite. And we're very concerned about that. 
Thank you, Mr. Pickering. I want to go to Mr. Papp as we've gotten the current perspective and uh, uh, Representative O'Day uh, gave you the credit that you truly deserve and even before your reputation precedes you. But, but take me through, I mean, one of the criticisms has been the exclusivity. And for the length of time that you have been in the community and been involved in the community, not only in the role in planning and zoning, but in, in all aspects of community and philanthropy and engagement. Uh, Tony, let, let me just step back for a minute. Uh, the heart of the matter re really is what uh, Scott uh, indicated that, uh, and, and what the, uh, the, uh, the, the basis of zoning as, as, as it's uh, codified by the uh, um, Supreme Court's uh, 1926 uh, decision, which means that you, your property right uh, is more, uh, it's surrounded with a community right. And the community has the right to, to, to discuss what you are doing on your own property. And that's what zoning is all about. The, the, to listen to the, the community because, because the community knows uh, not only the, the, the septic and, and, the, and the parking, but the, the roads, the schools, the, the environment, the, the terrain, and everything else what, what surrounds you. And, and if you take that, that uh, 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 right away from the community to, to look, at, look at the comprehensively, that uh, what happens on on a, a, on a property, then you you negate negate everything what uh, uh, over hundred years zoning achieved to to protect the community, and uh, this is what we are after. We, we want to maintain the community can, has has a say, and th that that is why the public hearing is is uh, important. The, the community ca can tell what is good for them and got good for everybody. And, and, the, and, the, and I think uh, as, as, uh, as uh, John pointed out, in almost every time the, the Planning and Zoning Commission is able to, to weigh whether the community input is productive or not. And, uh, and uh, I think, uh, the, the, the issue here is 1024 wants to take away from the community the right to do what is right for them. And, and I think, and our job is, and again, uh, without any kind of a, a, a political issue to, to protect the community right. Mr. Papp, what would you say to the state's philosophy that, that states in this statement that zoning is a state right that is granted to local municipalities. That that is that is correct. It's uh, it, uh, the zoning is based police power of the state, but it's confirmed to the com to the communities to to handle it, to to maintain it and and uh, and deal with it, and. Um, uh, to uh, if, if those who wants to take back to the to the state and uh, that that delegation of of the, the power uh, for the community would actually uh, kill zoning as as it is now and instead create a, a different kind of of tool which will not be uh, and as we discussed it, 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 that tool will not achieve the, the goal, what they want to do. Thank you, okay. Mr. Papp. Your me. insight is much value. Welcome back, First Selectman Moynihan. Welcome to the world of, of Zoom computer crashes. We've done all that. That's a, the only thing missing, you didn't mute yourself, right? Well, the first time I, my computer actually crashed. Anyway, I'm back. Uh, Francis, Francis has another subject I'd like to ask him to address because uh, Westcock has done some very interesting research 
on the diversity of Southwest Connecticut. And to the extent the premise of all these proposals are that zoning causes segregation um, or towns and cities use zoning to, to segregate. Francis, could you address some of, the, some of the research that has shown how diverse Southwestern Connecticut is as a suburb of New York? And sure, thank you, Kevin. I should point out that the Supreme Court ruled in 1917 that it was illegal to use zoning for racially discriminatory purposes. Um, and because of that decision, uh, uh, we saw other means such as uh, racially restricted deed covenants and redlining use that did have an effect on uh, where people lived. Um, but zoning has not been used for that. It's been illegal for over a century. Uh, when we look at Connecticut, uh, people have said Connecticut is the most segregated state or among the most segregated states. Well, when people make those statements, it, it really, it's alarming and we're concerned. And we heard a lot from our members and said, can you get us some more data? We want to see if this is true. And if so, we need to address it. Um, and so we ran some analyses. Um, they're on our website at westcog.org, W-E-S-T-C-O-G.org slash housing. And we use the most commonly used measure of uh, racial segregation, the dissimilarity index. And we did it at a census tract level using conventional census data, um, about the simplest analysis you could do, uh, very little room for discretion in this. And we found that yes, Connecticut is segregated, but so is the rest of the country. And we rank according to this me metric, which is the most common metric, number 16 in the country. Now, I'm not going to opine whether the residential patterns we see right now are um, perfect, could they be better or worse? That's a political decision. But the reality is Connecticut's in the middle of the pack. And when you zoom out and look at the entire East Coast or the Northeast, Connecticut fits into a pattern. It's very consistent with its neighboring states. The pattern you see is the farther out you go from a city, the less racially diverse it is. Farm country tends to be in the Northeast and East Coast, um, not in the Southeast, but in the Northeast, uh, largely white, and cities tend to be a lot more diverse. If you animate this pattern over time, and you can scroll through maps on our website, what you see is diversity flowing out from the cities into outlying areas, into the suburbs, exurbs, into rural areas. Um, we have data on all the communities in Connecticut, and they are integrating. Is the rate of integration fast enough? That's a political decision, but the rate of integration is not appreciably different than anywhere else in the Northeast. Um, what we're really seeing is a macro pattern. It's not a Connecticut pattern. We're seeing it in thousands of jurisdictions. Now, it is conceivable that the zoning of these thousands of jurisdictions all acts in the same way, but usually the simplest explanation is the correct explanation. And from our perspective, when we see a pattern that spreads across multiple states, we tend to think it's something larger. Maybe it's a macroeconomic factor. Maybe it's being driven by federal policy. And perhaps um, maybe that's where we should look to address what we see. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Kevin, for, for that very important question. I, I, I want to also acknowledge in the audience um, the chairwoman of the Planning and Zoning uh, uh, Commission in Westport. Uh, Ms. Danielle Dobin, who has joined us, thank you. And we also have the chairwoman of the Greenwich Planning and Zoning Board, uh, Ms. Margarita Albin. And their interest kind of leads to my next question. And I'll begin with uh, Mr. Moynihan. What are some of the suggestions and alternatives for our state government to collaborate with local government? just as you've set up the affordable housing fund to be able to look at uh, accessory dwelling units and some of the innovation of, of what Mr. Hobb is doing with the housing authority. What would you want Hartford and also our federal government during this time and period to be able to work and collaborate with your community to meet the goal that we all are aspiring to increase housing uh, capacity, to increase uh, affordability, accessibility and diversity? Uh, Mr. Moynihan, as, as first selectman, what is your vision and, and what Hartford as well as Washington can do to collaborate with you? Well, Tony, that's a good question. Um, you know, 30G is a stick. And, you know, we, we were 
proactive in, in reacting to the stick with a, a housing trust fund and that it's produced results. But someone the other day made a suggestion, which I think is a good, I think it was in reaction to the, uh, to the idea of a mansion tax. I mean, at the end of the day, housing is a capital intensive activity and land is, a, for, our, for our communities, it is an especially, especially expensive commodity. Um, but if we work together at, 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 in a regional basis, you know, Stanford and NOAA can work with, with the towns to, to address affordable housing on a regional basis. And I think it would be much more productive to have um, positive efforts rather than reacting to a stick like 30G. Um, you know, develop programs where regions can work together, cities and towns, to develop affordable housing where people have public transportation, where people have jobs. And so that's one, one suggestion that I think has come out of this debate. Overall, this debate has been very negative. I mean, you know, suggesting that people have bad motives in terms of, of the results that um, our current housing patterns. But the reality is everybody in good faith wants to produce more affordable housing. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. The tone's got to move from, from adversarial one way or the other to a collaborative effort. And uh, I'll go back to uh, Mr. Uh, Goodwin um, from a standpoint of what would you like to ask of the state and potentially Washington to help you meet your goals of, of uh, diverse and, and affordable and accessible housing? Yeah, Tony, a, a couple of things. One is change the denominator in 830J. That's an easy fix. Um, you, you add units, you're further behind. So that's an easy fix. Hartford audit should have done that, you know, whenever. Um, two is I'm, I'm happy you brought up Danielle and Margarita. Um, the problem I have with them is they're, they're smarter than I am, but I've been working with them very, very closely. And, and I think what we need to do is we need to continue that. And then following on Kevin's point is, is there should be a bipartisan working group and Hartford can help drive that. And we've started doing it already at the Fairfield County level, but you know, let's take this bipartisan approach um, to get that done. Um, those would be, uh, well, and another less, uh, uh, something that is in the bill that some of us sort of like is this concept of, you know, let Hartford tell us what basic form-based zoning can look like, you know, basic standards. Don't make us follow them, but help us out. You know, Lynn Abney Brooks, who's my planner on, you know, she, we've talked about that. She would love to have that. There's, you know, there's some basic blocking and tackling that can really help us a lot. And then the last thing I'll add is, is continue, we continue to work with the West Cogs of the world. Quite frankly, you know, over a year ago, I didn't really have a good sense of how West Cog can help us. You know, one of the great things about this process, this positive aspect of this process has been getting them more involved. And so that, you know, potentially should be done much more on a state on a, on a statewide basis. And Scott? Um, what I'd love to have, which I don't think can actually happen inside of a government system, is to allow a lot more leeway for local control to do good. And unfortunately, as soon as you get into a state or a federal system, it has to be defined in legal terms. And that's where you have, again, I mean, for affordable housing, $56,700 or less, that's what you're serving. Whereas New Canaan, it, with a higher um, cost of living in general, we need to be able to service people from let's say $56,700 up to maybe 90,000. How can we help people inside of that realm? How can we keep our, our communities diverse and have that police, um, you know, the police uh, officer who's been on the force for 15 years who earns more than that? How can we keep him in our community? And that means a little bit of backing off and allowing us again to not necessarily hit stringent goals, but to be able to again, do good inside of our own community. Um, is one other quick thing, I think that just for something that everyone that's on this call can definitely help do is submit in testimony to their representatives. You don't necessarily have to do it to Tom, but to everybody else, I mean, all the rest of the representatives, and I think even getting them to Tom allows him to go ahead and quote from them. But write to the representatives, make sure that you, they understand how you feel about these bills. Because if, if the representatives don't have that, then they can't represent us the way that we need to. And I would really hope that any representative from down in, in Southwest Fairfield County understands the importance of local rule over rule from Hartford. Well, Tony, Scott, Tony, you raised a I, very good... 
Up Tony, can I just jump in real quick to be Absolutely. very, very quick? Following up on what Scott said is, you know, so Scott's responsibility right now is the affordable housing component. What we need to be doing on the plant, New Canaan Planning and Zoning Commission, and we're trying to do this, is to work more on workforce housing and senior housing. And if, you know, if Hartford leaves, if, if 1024 goes through, we can't attack that because we're going to be inundated by other stuff. If we, if, if we can, you know, if the control can stay with us, then, we'll con th then we can continue to attack that next level of providing affordable housing that Scott's rightly talking about. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 John, that's a great point. And, and, and let me segue to uh, Mr. O'Day, Representative O'Day. Um, 1024 is the bill that we're talking about. We've also addressed the point from a standpoint of um, A30G. But what people need to understand, Tom, is the fact that how Hartford works is unique in the sense that there are potentially 12 bills related to zoning, enabling a, a legislation and, a, and affordable housing and land use that is in four different committees. People might have heard about the statewide property tax. Well, there was a bill related to the statewide property tax that if you do not meet your moratorium on affordable housing under 830G, then your town would be assessed the supplemental property tax. So that bill has germaneness. I, I, I hate to sound like a lawyer, and I'm not. It, the germaneness of a bill. There are potentially 12 bills in addition to 1024 that any of these particular language that you have just read and, and we debated about or articulated about can be inserted into any other bill and passed in a COVID managed legislative session. But Tom, can you take us through and talk about how people can find out about this? What other organizations out there are, are, are leading the way and, and trying to get more information and, and ease the clutter and ease the, confuse, uh, the, 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 the content so people can have a voice and, and be focused to let their legislators know? Absolutely, Tony, thank you. So Connecticut169strong.org. So CT169strong.org has, a, I put in the chat the list of the 12 bills. They're, they're coming out of, we talked about P&D that you're the, the good ranking member of, but we also have out of housing, Senate Bill 804, which is out of right multifamily housing development. Um, and then out of transportation, I talked about the 6570 transit oriented development, which we think we've got enough votes to kill uh, but then out of finance, the bill you talked about, SB 172, it's a, a state residential and commercial property tax tied to 830G that increases based on the percentage uh, of failure you have to meet that 10%. So uh, take a look at that ct169strong.org. It's also on Facebook. Um, and I want to thank you know, Mary, Mary Weingarten for putting this together. And um, you know there are 12 bills. So the, the best thing you can do is reach out, there's, there's um, and, and again, I don't mean to get political here, but the Republicans are all opposed. So I would encourage you to reach out to your Democratic colleagues. Stephanie Thompson's opposed. So, and just uh, take a look at those bills, reach out to your representatives and, and articulate to them why you're opposed and submit testimony on those 12. Even if you, the hearing date is over, which uh, many of these bills had hearing dates on March 15th and March 22, but you can still submit testimony. And we'll look at that if it ever does get to the House or the Senate the testimony is is reviewed by by us as legislators and uh and and i see pat callahan's here and pat pat's representing uh, the, the fine towns of danbury new fairfield new Middleford, and uh, sherman and he can uh, just say a brief word on on how you could get out in touch with him and, and and submit testimony as well go ahead pat may i may i um sure I, absolutely um... pat if you wouldn't mind and defer as uh, Mr. Goodwin said, the smarter of all of us uh, would be uh, sure, Margarita so. Albin. Pat, if you could wait. And uh, Margarita, thank you for your service to the broader community. And uh, Tony. I remember the first time I met you, what a personality. Welcome, Margarita. Uh oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tony, I'm actually substituting for Westport, who's cooking dinner. And she said she can't leave, but um, we've all been talking in the in Fairfield County in on Westcog. The other thing we've been talking that I wanted to mention to the legislators is we've been talking about a great deal of interest in um, HB 6107, which proposes to study 
how to help towns set affordable housing goals and how they might best advance them and to have a study group on it and also looks to revise 830G. Uh, we think that would be a great idea to support that bill. It was also heard on the 15th of March by P&D of which uh, Tony Huang is a member. And the other bill that we do not I personally don't think it should be passed, but it has a very interesting underlying concept is HB 6611, which purports to create an, an analysis of what is the housing need that underlies and what should be your fair share for affordable housing. Now, it can be a little bit of a scary proposition because we don't know what the answers would be, but the concept is the 10% mandatory affordable housing across the state is arbitrary. And some towns will never have, as somebody pointed out earlier, Scotland that has never had a, hasn't had a permit application in forever, they're not gonna have the demand. Western Connecticut has never had a, an 830G application. So what would their fair share be? Is 10% the right number? So those are two bills that uh, we in Fairfield County are quite interested in that have been heard by the Planning and Development Committee of the legislature. And I apologize, I tried to talk as fast as I can because I know we're probably running out of time. So thank you for letting me speak. Absolutely, thank you, Margarita. Uh, Representative Pat Callahan, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Senator Wang. And thanks, Representative O'Day. And thank you all for allowing me to butt into your meeting tonight. Uh, I grew up in lower Fairfield County and uh, my, my family came off the boat in Ireland there years ago and settled on West Rocks Road in Norwalk. Used to work out at the New Canaan Y. But, Happy St. Uh, Patrick's Week. <laughs> yes, and uh, but uh, I, I do represent the, the northern tip of Fairfield County and then the town of New Milford, which is a, uh, the largest landmass town in the state of Connecticut. Uh, I, I'm a new legislator and I, I've relied on uh, my senior legislators that are here today and they've all been very helpful. But when, but when I got elected, I said, I'm not going to vote for anything based on emotion or ideology. I'm gonna rely on fact. And the facts that you people provided tonight are very helpful. Uh, I will reach out to my to constituents in my area, none of which are probably on this call, but I thought it was important to be on the call to learn as much as possible. Uh, so uh, I, I do appreciate all the knowledge you you, uh, you relayed tonight. I'm, I'm on the Judiciary Committee, the Environment Committee, and the Education Committee, but I have interest in all the other committees. I'm not just limiting myself because I represent all the people of my area. So uh, uh, this is a, a great concern for, for my constituents because uh, we have some suburban and some very rural areas, and we're, we're quite worried about how uh, I've been contacted by a lot of people in my area, quite worried about how this will affect our towns. So well, I, I, I want to acknowledge you, Pat. We met at a, at a meeting, and as a new legislator, I shared the, the issues that are afoot right now in this discussion. And, and I, what struck me and reminded me is how much you wanted to know, but also at the same time, how little this information is being shared mm -hmm. with a broader audience. We, we have been getting, in some cases, a, a broad one perspective. And, and sometimes there is the perception of fear, hysteria, and exclusion, rather than, I hope, what we did today, an opportunity to articulate some of the devils in the details and, and the collaborative effort. I think First Electman Moynihan said it best, along with John and Scott, have said, People need to understand how hard and how far the community has come to reaching those goals of diversity and, and, and affordability and accessibility. And the other part that I hope you will share as a community leader with your community is this is this close to possibly happening and that people's voices need to be heard. So I wanna thank you very, very much. Uh, I wanna go back to uh, Mr. O'Day who is actually someone I look up to, not only figuratively, but also physically. Um, mm -hmm. Tom, talk to me about how people can get more involved beyond that talking um, to have their voices be heard and how they can proceed. Well, yeah, so, so uh, th there's, if, if you haven't heard of the site yet, you gotta go to CGA, just Google CGACT. It's our Connecticut uh, legislative site. And you can see all these bills that I put on, on the string there and you can submit testimony just popping on, on, the, on the, uh, the, the website there. And 
co contact your local legislator. I mean, look, that's our main job is listening to you all. For example, what I found out was the state of Connecticut has the, the, the Department of Economic and Community Development uh, a few years back and for many years before had grant money that it would give to towns to build transit-oriented development or design transit-oriented development and affordable housing. And we stopped funding that grant, those grant proposals back in 2017. We should be funding that to help towns create these types of uh, designs and goals collaboratively, uh, not with the stick, but rather the carrot. So I would encourage you all to go to that CGA CT website, go up to go to 169 CT strong or Connecticut 169 strong and take a look at these bills, submit testimony and talk to your legislators. That's our job. That's what Tony and I are paid to do is listen to you and be your voice up in Harvard. And Pat, Pat, Tony and I are very receptive to those types of calls. And I would encourage you to get involved because if you don't get involved, others are, and you, you, your voice won't be heard if you're not, if you're not there talking to us. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Tom. If I may, to go back to all the panelists and, and get closing uh, comments from them. But before you go, I, I want to acknowledge in the audience, and I might have missed other people, but I want to take a special time to thank Maria Weingarten for her work in, in organizing and coordinating this. Um, Ms. Penny Young, who has served in a local community. And I want to give a special shout out to Tom, your predecessor, uh, uh, John and Hope Hetherington, who is in this audience as well. And uh, I wanted to personally extend my uh, gratitude and fondness and, and love to both of them for, for their contributions to the community. Uh, but uh, uh, Mr. Moynihan, as the first selectman, uh, your, your, your closing thoughts, sir. Well, Tony, first of all, I'd like to thank you. Uh, you know, you obviously are, are, the, are the head of the spear here to, to try to uh, change minds up there. And I hope, um, I hope by these kinds of forums and, uh, and dialogue that we're gonna get people to really focus on a productive and, and uh, forward-looking solution rather than the negativity we're, we're hearing that is gonna have a lot of unintended consequences. And um, so, I, and I also would hope the governor and, and David Lehman would get involved and um, try to come up, especially all this federal money. You know, I was on a call at five o'clock with the governor's call, the lieutenant governor said, we're not gonna, we're never gonna see so much federal money raining down as we're getting right now with this, uh, this new America's, uh, uh, what is it called? Recovery Act or, or Rescue Act. Rescue plan. Rescue plan that, um, you know, some of that money should be used for this purpose because you need capital to go and build affordable housing. And, and as Tom said, it's much more productive to fund those kinds of proactive things than to, than to create um, rules that are really going to end up being very counterproductive. And uh, Mr. Papp? Um, as uh, the, the summary of all of this, what we heard is that the state should withdraw the, uh, uh, the stick, offer carrot, uh, should uh, we uh, should uh, vote down the 10 to 24 and substitute substitute it, substitute it with with the uh, with the kind of legislation where the, the the state will work together with the town because if the towns are hurting the state will be hurt thank you mr pap uh mr goodwin tony uh Thank you as well for putting this together. Very much appreciated. Um, look, my parting message is, first of all, I, I think most of the tone of this whole discussion has been positive. It has not been negative. And the going forward, I think New Canaan and the rest of the communities in Fairfield County will continue to work very hard on promoting additional inclusionary housing in, in where we work. And we're, we're gonna do that. I, I agree, uh, John, and, and your efforts and and the thought. I, I mean, I, I was, I, I think back to when you sat in the beginning and you said, I went and listened to Desegregate Connecticut. I engaged. I, 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 I wanted to learn that perspective because I can garner some of the good pieces. And it isn't a antagonistic, you're wrong, I'm right. And, and that is, I hope, the goal of this uh, dialogue is to get the information out, but also be receptive to finding the best solution. And it doesn't have an owner. It, it really is an implementation. And, and when you said that in the beginning, it really set the tone for me to believe that is absolutely my value proposition as well. And Scott, I want to go to you and compliment you again. Uh, you demonstrate 
when we hear so much in Hartford about the the developer and 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 the predatory, I, I I sometimes remind myself to take a step back that there are people with an economic model. Our home builders are an integral part of our economy, but to do it as a part of a community to help it grow and and thrive and sustain. You're a great example. I want to thank you again. Your closing thoughts, sir. Oh, thank you. And I'd like to actually point out that, you know, New Canaan is, is a really special community that we do. There's so many people that volunteer so much time. I mean, on this call, we have Peggy Daneman and Bernie Simkin, who are housing commissioners with me. You know, I, I follow in the footsteps of people who did things before me, like Chuck Berman. You know, I've worked with Laszlo Papp and with John Goodman. And I mean, the hours that, that people put in to donating their time to help keep our community as something special it's just staggering. And then you throw in town council and you throw in board of finance and you throw in board of education and you throw in all the other volunteers all over the place trying to make our community special. And it's people who really love the community and are very, very, very welcoming to the community. Um, as a small joke, I happened to be at a, a fast food restaurant today and their, their service was down and we were outside waiting and, and somebody came up. I explained what was going on. And they said, boy, you're really nice. You must not be from this town. And so I just chuckled. I won't identify the town where that was from, but I think this learning again from all the different mentors in this community and, and creating again a special place is huge. And that's one of the reasons why, again, we have a real surplus of demand to get into the town. So the more that Hartford can go ahead and just allow us to do good, to help provide the seed money, to help provide incentives, not sticks for trying to do better would be very, very helpful. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Mr. Pickering. Yes, thank you for putting this on tonight, Tony. I would say um, two things. One is uh, talk, listen and talk. And if you don't like how things are being run in your town, use your public hearings to make a difference while you still have public hearings. And if you care about public hearings, contact your legislator. Second, read the bill. There's been a lot of talk, a lot of lobbying, a lot of marketing. Um, the devil's in the details, but in this case, you can read the details. You can see what the devil actually looks like. So read the bill, uh, come to your own conclusions. And if some, you don't understand part of it, then maybe there's something there that should concern you and find somebody who does understand it and have them explain it to you. And if you don't trust them, get a second opinion, but read. Thank you, Francis. Um, and and I, I would like to thank the audience uh, for, for engaging. And, and I know I would love to have more of your questions. Um, uh, can anyone put into the, um, into the chat how they can send their thoughts and comments uh, to be registered? Um, that, that, that would be extremely helpful. Um, the, 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 my closing thought to this is the fact that uh, we serve our community. We don't serve a party. We don't serve an agenda. And for us as a legislator, when we go up and, and we think of what is in the best interest of the people we represent, um, that should be our goal. And, and there's transparency, accountability, um, and, and for us to find the solution to the challenge at hand of finding accessible, affordable, and diverse housing, which is a problem and a near crisis point. I, I, I want to acknowledge the fact that in this economic challenge post-COVID, we are going to have increased foreclosure impact. We are going to have a very high eviction rate as a result of the moratorium on eviction. So we're going to have a housing crisis need. So how do we solve it? I've always believed, as demonstrated by the, 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 the panelists here today and by so many other people that I've interacted with, that the best solution is one that is collaborative with neighborhoods, local state and federal collaboration. And what I heard from the local experts here is they welcome that, uh, utilizing the American Rescue Plan money to be able to have the state make some recommendations and work collaboratively. That is how we can solve it. But I also additionally, I believe that our housing challenge doesn't simply exist in our suburbs. It exists in our cities and it exists in our rural settings. So for us, maybe we want to reevaluate as we look at this and creating a new vision where we can create diverse, affordable, sustainable housing for every aspect of our community. That's one of my goals. And I hope that this dialogue can be moved to one of collaboration rather than confrontation. 
So I want to thank you all for participating here today and thanking the audience as well. If people want more information, they can go to ct169strong.org to get the bill information, or you can go to cga.ct uh, uh, and get the information on the legislators uh, representing you. Uh, so, I will so defer what, to the senior person, Mr. O'Day. So Mr. yes, O'Day, can you close us out? So closing us out, I just want to say to tell everybody, look, it, just so you know, we're in a legislative session. It's very busy right now. Uh, committee he uh, hearings go 12, 14, 16 hours. And Tony, who doesn't even represent New Canaan, was asked to host this as the ranking of P&D, who knows a ton of information, a lot more than he lets on. And here he is hosting New Canaan, uh, a New Canaan event. And Tony, I, I, got, I got goosebumps. I'm so appreciative of all you're, you're doing and working for us. And, and to everybody on this, this call, look at who your leaders are. I mean, look, I don't care your party. We got Penny Young, we got Steve Carl, Rich Townsend, Tom Butterworth, uh, Scott Hobbs, John Goodwin. I mean, it's amazing. Bernard Simpkin, look at the talent and, and Laszlo Papp, Kevin Moynihan as our leader. I, I mean, it's just amazing the leaders that we have in this town. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you to our local leaders. And uh, be safe, reach out, happy to have coffee with anybody and everybody. So thank you. Thank you all. Be safe and healthy, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all.